happened in here? A vicious attack. House of Horrors. Leaves two young men clinging to life. I've never seen anything like that. We'll try to find this guy before some other stupid stuff happens to somebody else. Both ways, back your hands up. Then. This reads a lot like an assassination. An innocent grandfather gunned down. Save my life. Save my life. While trying to protect a friend. Is this some type of joke? It's no joke. And the clock is ticking. For homicide detectives, their chance of solving a murder is cut in half if they don't get a lead within the first 48 hours. Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1.21 AM, a quiet summer night in the Carbondale neighborhood. A man wakes up to someone beating on his front door. 911. Neighbors, they need help. What do they need help for? They want the cops to come over to chase away the bad guy with a hammer. Police and EMS find two men in the living room with severe head trauma. They're rushed to the hospital where doctors fight to save their lives. that apparently have been beaten in the head with a hammer. Patrol found a couple of witnesses, so I came downtown to interview them while the rest of the team is out at the scene. Where's this death and destruction at? It occurred right here in the front room. Uh, it's really gnarly. Yeah? White male, no shirt. Right, first time the head. Do we know anybody's names? Yeah. Dustin Van Woodenberg. The first victim found on the couch is 30-year-old Dustin Van Woodenberg, born and raised in Oklahoma. He's a loving father to a young son. The second victim, found on the bed, is a 22-year-old male. There's five people at the house at the time. Two of them are downtown at Deckard Division, and two of them are at the hospital. And, and the, the fifth one is? The fifth person wasn't on the scene when police arrived. Are your people doing stuff inside, I guess, or? They're waiting on a warrant. OK. I'm going to head downtown to type a warrant so we can process the scene. We'll just go back there and see what we can get from both of these young, young people. White will interview the victim's roommates. I can't imagine what these two people have witnessed tonight. It must have been horrible. All right, young lady, I appreciate your patience. Who all lives in the house? The owner. She says the other witness owns the house. What's he like? Oh, he, he is a blessing for all of us, just Letting us all stay there. Okay. And no rent, no nothing. Uh, Dusty. She Dusty. says Dustin and the other victim stay in the living room. OK, so this living room kind of doubles for like a bedroom. Too. Yeah, it's really big. OK, so Dusty. Who mm -hmm. else? Jose. A man named Jose lives in the basement. OK, do you know Jose's, Jose's last name? Ideas. Jose just moved in two weeks ago. What's he like? Quiet. Tell me kind of what you know about tonight. I got home about 8.30. Nobody was there when I got home. Took a shower, went to sleep. I heard TPD come in the house and sat there like, what's going on? Open the door, and then he's like, where's the guy that did this? And I start crying, because Dusty's sitting there. He's laying on the couch. <laughs> he's just bleeding. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm sorry that you had to see all of that, okay? 
I prayed for him. So yes. Those, those prayers get answered. Absolutely. Sit tight for a second, young lady. All right, dude. You've uh, you've been huge to to be patient for me. All right, I appreciate that. Tell me what happened tonight. Well, you go to Glen for Jose. I've been calling, I've been calling him Bones. He says a few hours before the attack, Jose, aka Bones, drove him and the victims to Dustin's brother's house to pick up some tools. When I came back, I would say maybe ten or eleven. They went into the living room, just kind of chill while me and Jose made dinner. Dustin and the other victim fell asleep while he and Jose were cooking and drinking. We were having a great time. Mm -hmm. Like he just, I you mean, know, shifted gears, like all of a sudden. And I don't know where he's telling me all the stuff that we have in the truck that we just got from Dusty's that used to be his parents. He says Jose claimed the tools they picked up were taken from his family. We his life, you know, like, well, you know, all stuff in the truck that belonged to my family. I can get these guys. Watch, watch. I'm thinking, you know, just joking. God's a damn him. I've never seen anything like that. Forty hit. Atlanta, Georgia. 4.58 p.m. A desperate call comes in from an auto body shop on the southeast side. Atlanta, 911. I need an ambulance. A person has been shot. We need an ambulance now. First responders rush to the scene and find a man with several gunshot wounds. They rush into the ER. But he dies. So what do we got? The guy in there that got shot was Tony Sappho. Forty-six-year-old Tony Sappho was a certified auto mechanic, an electrical technician, who had a passion for cars. He leaves behind three children, two grandchildren, and his fiance. You wanna walk me through the scene? Let me know what you see. Uh, basically, one through seven is all shell case. Was the victim in the passenger seat or the driver's seat? The seat. The driver's seat, yeah. And then I think he got hit and then crawled out that side. That door was open when uh, responder officers got here. Tony was shot twice in the chest and once in the arm. There's a couple of bullet holes in the driver's door. The victim was obviously shot multiple times, crawled out the passenger side. This reads a lot like an assassination. Two hours in. He's sitting in his office, he hears a couple of gunshots. Who told you that? Detective Joe Golfin finds a potential witness, one of the workers at the auto shop. Were well, you inside your office in the back here? I heard a couple of three shots, you know. Okay. Was he standing on the driver's side of the car? Yes, sir. The dude holding a gun. You familiar with him? Yeah, I know. Then you know his real name? All I know is T. Okay. How long have you known him for? Um, can you describe him? Maybe five, 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 six, and we are about ten pounds. What's his hair like? He's bald here. Bald, okay. He's done in a tan color. Okay. He says after the shooting, T fled in a tan SUV. 
Who else was here when the shooting happened? I guess there was a lot of guys back there. I have a food table back there to show them. All of the senior citizens and the folks who shoot the food by now. Is there anybody that's still here now? Thank you, sir. Take care. That's the pure definition of malice murder. Someone standing five feet away from the driver's window and using an automatic weapon to shoot inside the driver's seat. So, um, you know, we're definitely going to be hunting for a, uh, a malicious killer. Then. He didn't really want to give his name or anything, or they couldn't get it from him. Patrol officers get a lead from an anonymous tipster. He gave this number as the suspect's phone number. Right now, I need to do some research on that phone number and see if I can find out who this guy T is. As detectives wrap up the scene. Well, Major Lee's at the hospital so, with Major Shepard. He said there's a witness over there, but they don't know there. A man at the hospital with Tony's family says he has information about the shooting. I'm sending Golf into the hospital to see if he can't figure out who it is. It would be nice to know who this gunman was tonight. This is not a guy that I feel comfortable waiting until the next day to try to identify or get a warrant for him. At the hospital, oh, Detective Golfin interviews the witness. What happened? You know, they shoot pool. I watch the whole shoot pool. He pushed me. When he was drunk, he pushed me. He acted like he wanted to fight me. So I told him, hey, man, like, I'm, I'm sparing you, bro. You're an older guy. Out of respect, man, just chill. So that's when Tony got into it. Tony was like, hey, bro, leave him alone. Why are you doing it? He says the victim tried to intervene. Tony was like, man, just chill, bro. Like, go to the room somewhere. Go take your drunk ass off. So, he left. So about an hour later, he just popped up. He had a Mac. He says T came back with a Mac-10 submachine gun. He was like, I'm gonna pop, pop on you. Pop, pop. In Tulsa, Dustin Van Woodenberg and another man are fighting for their lives after being bludgeoned with a hammer. Now, Detective Jason White is speaking to their roommate who witnessed the vicious attack. It seemed fake to me because I've never seen that happen to somebody's head. I can hear him hit him multiple times. I didn't know what to do. What did you do? I, just, uh, I went to go get help. I went and beat at my neighbor's door until I woke up. When he was talking about that stuff belonging to his family that you guys picked up from Dustin, was he acting, like, pissed off that? No, he was, like, giggling and laughing. OK. You get the feeling in any way that the tools may have been stolen? You know, like, it didn't make any sense to me, you know? What's he like normally? He just usually works and works and works. He seemed like a decent person, you know? So I'm thinking, did he just lose his mind? OK. Be patient, and I'll be right back with you, OK? Two young men might end up dead over nothing because somebody flipped the switch in a drunken state. I don't know. This is it's different. It's different. Ted Bundy-like, brutally beating two people for nothing. Here we go, right here, Pim. 30-year-old Jose Diaz has no history of violence. 5'6", 145. Goes by the name of Bones. All right. 
Where would I find this guy? I have no idea. He's just looking in my basement. There's vehicles in there. So. Okay. He says Jose's white Chevy Suburban is still parked in his driveway. All right, sit tight. We'll try to find this guy before some other stupid stuff happens to somebody else. Then, homicide white. She was thinking about stuff, and this this stuff came to her mind. White gets a call from the officer who drove the female witness home. There's an abandoned house uh, about a street behind where this occurred, and, and he's talked about going there before if something ever happened. Okay. And I noticed there was a window open, and she said that that window wasn't open the other day. So there's a good possibility he might be there. Okay, that's good stuff. I like it. Thanks, bro. Okay. All right, bye. Well, let's go. Let's go out there real quick. I hope he's in there and he's sitting in the house, passed out with a bloody mallet in his hand. Yeah. We're gonna head to the house where this happened. Okay. What the hell happened in here? Holy cow. To do that kind of damage to somebody, you're you're swinging with a purpose. House of Horrors. In the basement, where Jose has been living. Well, this is kind of spooky down here. Does he sleep on that? What is... That's the only thing I saw down here. That's the only place he could be. Man, I can imagine living down here. Is there a hammer? We haven't found it. I think you took it with him. Yeah, I think he's probably fairly close, unless he got a ride, because his truck's still in the driveway. With no trace of Jose. I'm going to send this arrest affidavit through, and we'll put it out to the media so people will be on the lookout for him. Someone who snaps at a moment's notice is really scary because he could go out and do this to somebody else. Here's a picture of the suspect. His name is Jose Diaz. Tulsa detectives say they need him off city streets just as soon as possible. We need that person before he has the next beer in custody. While the warrant squad scours the streets for Jose. Let's run by the hospital. White and Leatherman head to the hospital to check on the victims and their families. We'll go give them as much of an update as we can and answer any questions they have. still in some really bad shape. One was going to surgery as we speak. The other one is still unconscious. I am amazed that these young men are alive. In Atlanta, the homicide team just learned the victim, Tony Sappho, 
was sticking up for a friend when the suspect, T, pulled a submachine gun. Tony was actually on the pool table. He was playing. When he seen the gun, he went to his car. He was just trying to get away. Yeah. So, when I seen the gun, I walked out the door to my car to get my pistol. So, I don't know what happened. Why did she even shoot him? saw T shoot Tony? No. And T turned at me and started walking towards me. Tony said, go, bro. When I peeled off, T was walking around the car, and Tony's still going, go, go, go. When I was pulling off, I still heard him shoot. Was there some kind of beef between them? No. They've been knowing each other 10 plus years, 28. While he's going to get his gun, T starts shooting Tony while Tony's in the car. Does he know T's real name? No, he just knows T. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate it. Anytime, man. That's the victim right there. One of 33 cycles? Good heavens. Tony's record shows several run ins with the police. I say the last time he got in trouble was uh, 2010. It's interesting. Maybe he's been trying to turn his life around, change his ways. It seems like everybody knows that T shot Tony, but no one can tell me who T is. I have to know if this phone number is going to lead us anywhere. Leon Packer runs the phone number given by the tipster at the crime scene. Come on. No whammy. No whammy. Tevizion Troy. Bald headed at five six two ten. He's forty five. See drugs, DUI, Agasalt in 98. In 1998, Tavision shot a man during a drug deal and served seven years for aggravated assault. Hello? Hey, this is Detective Kevin Leon Packer. You spoke with Detective Golfin earlier over there at Grady Hospital. Are you somewhere where I can pull up on you to show you some pictures? Yeah, I'm at, I'm at his home. Do you want to hop in the back seat? And I'll just show you to show you real quick. Um, all right. Whenever you're ready, just flip that over and take a look at the photographs and see if you recognize anybody. Okay. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to meet with me. And I'm going to do my part to do right by your friend. I didn't know Tony, and I know he was no fan of the police. But I'll right. be honest with you, man. That was the past. Changed, man. Hard to go with, man. Uh, he's a um, founder of a car club. Tony founded a car club in 2013. He and his club volunteered in the community, mentoring children and helping homeless teens. When T looked at me and looked like he was going to shoot me after he shot him, he told me, go. Save my life. Yeah. Save my life. The victim was actually trying to defend someone who was, for lack of a better word, getting picked on. This was a man who 
turned his life around and started doing better. With an arrest warrant in hand, patrol and the fugitive squad searched through the night. And into the next day. But division is nowhere to be found. As the first 48 ticks away. I was with the family about to throw some burgers on the grill, um, and I got the call saying that he was in custody. The fugitive squad spotted a tan SUV, like the one seen fleeing the crime scene, leaving to Vision's girlfriend's apartment complex. They initiated a traffic stop, and lo and behold, there was our suspect sitting in the passenger seat. The female driver said she didn't know where they were headed, that uh, our suspect just told her to drive and to keep on driving until he gave her directions or told her to stop. So um, his obvious intent here was to flee. I really want to explore his motive for, for shooting this guy. The dispute wasn't a big enough of a deal to kill somebody. Don't forget about me. Well, I, I wasn't here, which is why I'm dressed like this. I'm Detective Kevin Leon Packer. I was off. I was about to throw some burgers on the grill with my family. That's what, what took a while. Um, but I came here to have the benefit of us having a conversation. Um, do you want to have a conversation? Would you like to ask me some questions? I want to know what I'm charged with. You're charged with murder, malice murder. Alice Is this some type of joke? It's no joke. In Tulsa, Dustin Van Woodenberg and another man are in critical condition after being attacked with a hammer. The suspect, their roommate, Jose Diaz, is still on the loose. Both families are just completely in shock, and right now, their lives have been turned upside down. They just can't figure out why, and there is no answer to that why from what we've heard. The doctor seems to think that they should be able to save both of them, but we'll see. Before coming to the police department 18 years ago, I worked 10 years in the medical field as a surgical tech. Been on about 4,500 to 5,000 surgeries, and I've seen a lot of death and destruction. You just don't see too many people that's, that have this type of an injury even make it to an operating room. The next day, with Jose still on the loose, White searches social media for a lead. Here we go. This is Karina. That's his ex. And finds Jose's ex-girlfriend. These are Jose's kids right here. Jose has two young children with Karina. I've got her phone number here. It looks like that she works at a restaurant in Bixby. Strangers are only going to let you hang out at their house when you're wanted and you're on TV for so long. So therefore, you turn to the friends and family that love you the most. At Karina's workplace. Hello. Hey, Karina. Yeah. Hey, this is uh, Jason White. I'm a detective with Tulsa Police. Are you at work? OK, hey, would you mind uh, coming out the back entrance, and, and I'll flag you down so I can visit with you briefly? Hello, young lady. Hi. OK, so do you know what happened? Yes. Where can I find him? Do you, have you talked to him? I haven't spoken to him since the Monday after Father's Day. 
Karina says she last spoke to Jose two months ago by phone. His kids were trying to call him and speak to him, and he wouldn't answer. When he finally did answer, he told them he was sick. OK, does he have a phone number? Um, yes. I don't know if it's still working. Sure. Um, 918. Uh-huh. She gives White Jose's cell phone number. What do you know that happened? He took a hammer to two men asleep. They're clinging to life. That's the reason why I left him. I have back issues now because he would throw me up against the wall to take the keys and take my money and take off for the entire weekend. He drinks too much and does too many drugs. What's he get like when he drinks? Crazy. And so there's no way in the world that you would ever help him? No. I mean, he's the father of my children. We spent nine years together. There's always going to be a part of me that oh, cares sure, about him, but sure. he needs help. Where's he from in Mexico? or is Mexico he, City. Is it is a possibility in your mind that he may go back there? I honestly don't know if he try to go back. Well, if you happen to hear anything, dear, just uh, give me a call anytime, OK? And I'm sorry you're having to deal with this. And it, it sucks. I had to tell my kids before they saw it on TV. Yeah, it, it, I, I'll tell you what, it, it's, it, it was a bad situation. All right, nice meeting you. She said she wouldn't help. She wouldn't help him at all. No way. I believe her. I think she'd probably like to have him just out of her life. As the first 48 winds down. All right, good deal. Thanks, bro. Talk to you later. Bye. I was just on the phone with the warrants unit. We're going to get them on board, and hopefully they'll be able to narrow down the search for us and track him down. First 48, Tulsa homicide responded to a vicious hammer attack that left Dustin Van Woodenberg and another man in critical condition. Discovered the suspect was their new roommate, Jose Diaz. Learned the victims might survive their injuries and scoured the city for Jose without any luck. A few days later. OK, sounds good. All right, bye. Jose Diaz was arrested. The warrants squad learned Jose was making calls from Carthage, Missouri, 130 miles northeast of Tulsa. He was at a bus station, so I'm sure he was about to continue his flight somewhere. I just want to know the truth. And the way I'm going to play it is, hey, man, this is your opportunity to show that you regret your, what you did and that you actually have a heart. It's mighty hot here in Carthage. Have a seat over there, if you don't mind. Hey, my name's Jason White. This is Ronnie Leatherman. OK, basically, I want to talk to you about that incident that happened down there in Tulsa. Yeah, I don't remember what happened. I was uh, doing a lot of drugs, a lot of drinking. I don't remember anything. Let me just be real with you, because we drove a long ways to come out here. And we really wanted to give you an opportunity to basically show that you have a heart. <laughs> I mean, I Let me tell you what you did. You have a couple of warrants for assault with a deadly weapon. You're lucky it's not for murder. I mean, honestly, neither one of these two guys that were assaulted have died, which is excellent. I don't, I don't remember. That's excellent, because I'm telling you, they both got hit in the head with a sledgehammer that you swung at them. I mean, I don't remember what happened. Are you suffering from any sort of mental illness? Not that I know of. 
What kind of drugs have you been doing? That might explain some of this. Meth? <laughs> Come on, dude. If I remember, I will tell you okay. that I don't remember. How did you end up here? Walking. Every once in a while, have a ride and. Both of these guys got multiple strikes to the head with a sledgehammer. Their lives are, are done as they knew it. And I really had hopes that you would at least show some sort of regret. About what had happened instead of just nothing. If I did what would, would happen, yeah. I mean, I feel sorry for, I mean, for them because, I mean, I, if, if I did it, I mean, I don't remember it. And if I remember, we'll let you know. Thanks for your time. Yeah. OK. Bull jive. I don't believe that for a minute. He knew that yeah. something significantly bad happened, and that's why he took off. No real remorse on his part. He can't even tell me what kind of a drug, what kind of drugs he takes, which is nonsense. Definitely one for the books, man. It's sad. You know, I kind of get these cases a little bit when somebody's been doing some bad stuff and, you know, there's a risk to it. But when somebody's sleeping in their bed, they're not doing anything to anybody, that's brutal. And I don't, I don't understand it. I just can't believe those young men are alive. That's shocking to me. There's a real potential that they're going to have long-term effects that could be paralysis, blindness. The doctors don't even know what their full recovery potential is going to be. No doubt they're lucky to be alive, but they, they both have a long road ahead of them. In Atlanta, Tony Sappho was gunned down after standing up for a friend at an auto shop. Now, Detective Kevin Leon Becker needs the suspect to vision Troy to talk. You're telling me that you have no idea why you might be charged with murder. Yes. Do you know anybody that might have been killed recently? No, sir. Today's Sunday, two days ago. Where were you at uh, 5 o'clock PM? I was on Friday. I was a little bit of boy right now, Cleveland Avenue and stuff like that. Try to narrow it down for me. Um. 4.58 p.m. That's a pretty narrow focus. 4. 4.58 p.m.? Yeah. I was still at uh, Target and Lawton Avenue. Tavision claims at the time of the murder, he was at a store six miles from the crime scene. OK. The cell phone that you had in your possession when he uh, arrested you today, is that your cell phone? Yes, sir. OK. Um, is that the phone that you would have had two days ago? OK. So when we asked the phone company, give us his phone records for this day, give us Tavision's phone records for Friday, I think what's going to happen is I'm going to find out that you were not anywhere near Target on Moreland Avenue. You know, I don't want to waste your time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and mine's either. But I mean, at this point in time, you know, I remain silent because this is like you telling me where I was. I'm telling you, I'm being straight up honest with you. So from this point on, just get in touch with Verizon and get all your information. And I'll we, do that. We'll we do that you know, trial or whatever court. All right. Well, listen, I, I, I would have been happy to tell you a little bit more about what led for you to be here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, it's nothing to talk about. It's nothing to talk about, sir. All right. Burgers on the grill, and, and if you can, try to get an officer to transport. OK. You know I'll saying? call you a ride, Thank man. You, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Have a great day. He provided an alibi. But the problem was is he chose an alibi that was on the other side of town. It's as good as I, I could have hoped for that he provides an alibi that I can disprove. So 
I think we're in good shape. Call the paddy wagon, get them loaded up, and uh, get on back to those burgers. In less than 48 hours, Leon Packer has closed his case. I look healthy, but I, I eat normal. was an 88 Monte Carlo T-top. That was just like his baby. A year after Tony's murder... He just wanted to help everybody. His family and friends from his car club gather to carry on his dreams. Tony would go to alternative schools. These are children that have been dismissed from public school. He would talk to them about their long-term goals. What do you want in life? What do you want to be? And he, he was honest. I've lived a rough life. You don't want to go through what I've been through. If you met Tony, you pretty much loved Tony. Everything that he had established, the car club community, the community service, we are carrying on his legacy. I found out after he passed away that he had already made arrangements for us to um, get married. And it was going to be a surprise. The plans that Tony made for our marriage would have been awesome. And all I do is just kind of fantasize about him every now and then. But now it's just a dream. It's not reality. It's just a dream. <laughs> 